Okay, hello, ACS community, wherever you are coming in from. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is our final 2020 monthly speaker event for our local or for the ACS uh, San Francisco Bay chapter. So I'm Susan Hopp, a board member, and I'm here with my fellow board member, Gail Koza. Now, this is our third online event that we've done. And uh, interestingly, we've seen some benefits to this uh, pandemic caused move to uh, online. So we're attracting much bigger audiences from uh, sometimes around the world. So that's exciting. And the other thing, uh, we are recording all of our talks. So if you, and they're up on our, our website, our chapter's website. So if you've missed either of the last two, one was on the Antarctic and the other one, um, the last one in October was on killer whales. And you want to, you missed them or you just want to revisit them. They were, I think that good. You can go to our website and, um, and, and enjoy. So first we want to thank you for your generosity in the donations. Uh, it's just been really wonderful. We really appreciate it. It certainly supports our mission. And for as many of you know, the American Cetacean Society is the oldest nonprofit dedicated to the protection of whales, dolphins, and porpoises and their habitat. And we do this through three things, three vehicles really, education, community engagement, and by awarding uh, grants in support of marine biology science. So by being here and of course, through your donations, you support our work, thank you. So we're really excited for tonight's talk, sea otter conservation and ecology in the 21st century. And before we get started and I introduce our speaker, um, just a note, we always have a really lively Q&A session after the talk. And uh, please put your questions in the Q&A box that you should see on the lower part of the band of uh, the, Zoom, the Zoom window. And uh, we'll do our best to get to them uh, in the Q&A portion of tonight. But now I'm happy to introduce our speaker, Brent Hughes. And Brent is an assistant professor of marine ecology and conservation at Sonoma State University. Research in his lab seeks to determine the processes that affect the stability of coastal ecosystems. His, his research centers around coastal habitats of seagrass, salt marsh, and kelp. These are all foundation species, which provide valuable ecosystem services, yet are threatened by human activities. And Brett summarizes his research into four themes. First, the consequences of predatory recovery on the functioning and stability of ecosystems. Second um, theme, the relative influence of climatic drivers and human threats to coastal ecosystems. Third, the role of foundation species in healthy functioning near shore ecosystems. And lastly, the very important theme of informing the management and restoration of what drives ecosystem resilience. All so very relevant uh, to today. So Brent, thank you again for being here and I'm handing it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. And thank you, Gail. And thank you to the American Cetacean Society for hosting this, the San Francisco Bay chapter. Um, <clears throat> I'm kind of a, a new uh, newbie to the society. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I, I should preface this all, and I think you'll get a little bit of it in the talk that, um, you know, a lot of what, what uh, Susan was mentioning was that, you know, a lot of this focuses on ecosystems. It's not so much about sea otters as the ecosystem, primarily veget vegetated ecosystems in, in the ocean. And um, 
so I, I like to preface these talks that I give on sea otters with uh, the fact that I'm not a sea otter biologist. Um, and that's part of the story. Um, I'm a marine botanist. And so I study sea grasses and marshes and kelp. That's kind of what I'm interested in. And um, it really was my introduction to sea otters and then just getting kind of thrown into the fire of the sea otter biology world was really by accident. And so um, ju just to preface that, and, um, and I, I think you'll see why I was able to actually do sea otter research without actually being a sea otter biologist. I have a, a, a great network of collaborators um, that I work with that are sea otter biologists and do understand this stuff. Um, and I think that I'll tie it all in together um, towards the end of the talk. So, uh, and I apologize for the title. I, I should have changed it, but it kind of fits, fits into this whole motif of, of time. And um, what Susan mentioned was, you know, we're talking about 21st century sea otter conservation. But the key here is that we really need to look into the past um, to fully understand the complexities uh, surrounding sea otter and really um, large megafauna uh, conservation. And so I think you're gonna get a little bit of that um, in this talk and, and hopefully it, it can apply to systems and animals that you're thinking about. Um, and so, you know, this first slide, I think kind of summarizes a lot of the history and that's where we're, where we're kind of gonna start off with is the history. Um, so in the top or left-hand panel, you see some indigenous hunters um, from the Aleutian Islands. Um, these hunters were uh, forced um, by the European uh, fur trade uh, hunters to, to go into areas that they, you know, they were not familiar with, but since they were such expert hunters of sea otters, and other marine mammals, um, they were they were recruited and more forced into slavery to go hunt in, in areas like California. Um, <clears throat> and you can see why in this in this lower left hand panel, in in this panel here, it's it's the the pelts of the sea otter and having a million uh, hair follicles per square inch that drove this whole story. Um, uh, you know, they were hunting for the pelts. They were um, highly sought after, um, primarily in Asia markets, for um, the, just the luxurious uh, fur. And I, I don't know if any of you have touched a sea otter pelt. It is probably one of the softest things you'll ever touch. And um, so you can see why it was just by touching it, uh, a sea otter pelt, why it was so sought after. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, you see these kind of earlier in the bottom right hand corner. Um, images of a sea otter, not necessarily anatomically correct, <laughs> I would say. Um, but, you know, they, this was at the time when they were just kind of discovering, the, at least for the Western cultures, what sea otters were. But the, the big emphasis is that the, these indigenous, indigenous communities have been interacting with sea otters for, for millennia and actually managing them too. Um, so that's a really important part of the story. And another important part of the story is in the upper right hand corner, that's Stellar Sea Cow. Um, and Stellar Sea Cow was one of the first marine mammals to actually go extinct because of humans. Um, and sea otters were very much on that pathway um, um, before major legislation and conservation efforts uh, helped promote their recovery um, and the loss of them going extinct. So that's kind of where we start off with is this kind of like this history of sea otters on in the Pacific coast. So <clears throat> most of this society, this community probably has learned about the sea otters role in the kelp forest. And we know that sea otters are these kind of heroes of the kelp forest, right? Through uh, what we call a trophic cascade. And the trophic cascade operates in these kelp forest systems um, because of the biology of the sea otter. And we know that the sea otters lack blubber, like most of the other cetaceans um, that you all are familiar with. Um, you know, they're, they're mustelids, so not necessarily cetaceans, which 
kind of goes outside the box here, but um, but that's okay. They're they're marine ma they're still marine mammals, um, but they do lack this blubber layer, and they have this nice fur coat, which they need to spend a lot of time grooming it just to kind of keep the air trapped between them and the water, um, their skin and the water, and that kind of maintains their internal uh, internal core temperature. But on top of that, they need to eat a lot. The sea otter needs to eat a lot. It needs to actually eat 25% of its biomass every single day just to survive. And so what I like to tell students when I'm teaching them about sea otters is that, you know, it's like you going out and eating 20 super burritos and still being hungry. Um, you know, that's a phenomenal feat in its own, but the sea otter needs to do this every single day. And so because of that, um, they, their consumption of, of marine prey, it's what makes them kind of these, these keystone species, which we call keystone because um, they, are, they have this kind of disproportionate effect. So there's not a whole lot of sea, sea otter biomass in a kelp forest, but their effects are quite large because of how much they need to eat. Um, so these are really important kind of biological um, facts that you should keep in mind throughout the talk. Um, but in the kelp forest, where they were, the ecology of the sea otter was first described, um, we know that they have the ability to eat lots of urchins. And urchins, if left unchecked by predators, can decimate a kelp forest. And so because of that, it's the trophic cascade. It's, it's basically sea otters through their consumption of urchins have an indirect, effect, indirect positive effect on the kelp. And so this has been one of the most cherished paradigms that we have in ecology is this sea otter trophic cascade. And because of it, and because of a lot of historical accident, what we think about the sea otter um, is primarily as a kelp forest animal. But this is where our, this talk kind of goes outside the box. And what I want you to do as the audience is kind of um, think about sea otters, not just as California animals, but as also um, animals that occupy different habitats. And so, you know, what I'm proposing here is, are sea otters heroes of the salt marsh? We don't really think of sea otters as salt marsh animals. Um, but through our research, and this is my research with all, all these great colleagues that I work with, we're finding that if we follow around sea otters as they're re in their state of recovery, we're learning a lot more about their biology that science just didn't know five or 10 years ago. And so by end, the end of this talk, um, I should have convinced you that sea otters can be heroes of the salt marsh too. Um, and a lot of this uh, it stems from the work I've, I've been doing with colleagues across the world um, that really challenges some of these old paradigms in ecology and conservation, um, where we think of these top predators or these large consumers in this kind of package box, you know, and so this diagram comes from a paper um, that we wrote uh, with some colleagues uh, a couple of years ago that really kind of challenges the, these old paradigms that have been with us for, you know, 50 or 60 years. Um, so in the top or left hand corner, we have a harp seal. Um, that harp seal is on a North Carolina beach, um, basically a, a, a subtemperate subtropical area. And these seals were not thought to have been able to cross those kind of boundaries, but with conservation efforts, with legislation, they've been able to recover and they're moving south, which is kind of strange. Wolves, gray wolves. Um, a lot of us know about the gray wolf example from the Yellow, uh, Yellowstone National Park. And, um, but gray wolves have been recovering as well, especially in the Western states of the United States and Canada. Um, and what we're finding is that these wolves can actually be marine predators, um, such as this gray wolf kind of hanging out in a rocky or a tidal bench, uh, you, you know, scrounging for food. And they're in fact, excellent swimmers. They can cross channels in the ocean, no problem. 
Um, in the another in the panel C, we see a mountain lion in a grassland. In panel D, we see an orangutan in a deforested area, which it was thought that orangutans um, didn't do well in forested areas. And in, in fact, we're finding that they actually can do pretty well. Um, panel E, we see a jackal on the beach um, hunting in the in the kind of that wave swept zone. And then panel F um, is a, a species that I've actually studied, the river otter. And what we're finding with river otters is that river otters can be sea otters. Um, and so there's a, a river otter hauled out on a rocky bench in the ocean. And it hunts on very similar prey as the sea otter. It hunts crabs, it hunts clams, it hunts mussels. But also, is it, unlike the sea otter, really good at hunting fish. Um, and that includes fish in the sea. Um, so they're able to use a, a, a variety of habitats that, you know, from this historical accident of overhunting a lot of these animals, limiting their habitats. Uh, we have have this kind of really condensed view of the world and what, you know, really what conservation could be. So when I say ghosts of conservation past, um, this is what we're talking about, is that if we look into the past, we might be able to see these examples and have a much richer understanding of the ecology and biology of these large consumers. So now we're gonna shift our focus primarily on sea otters and sea otters fit into this package of, uh, you know, this historical accident of our, our, our skewed understanding of what the ecology of these of these these animals are, and um, it really goes to this idea of the niche. And the niche is just basically, you know, this ecological term that describes the the number of habitats an animal can use. And for sea otters in particular, um, we have a very skewed understanding of what their actual niche was. And again, this is all due to a historical accident. Um, when, he, when the field of ecology, modern ecology, first started taking off in the 20th century, that was at the time where sea otters were probably at their lowest abundance or near their lowest abundance. Um, so the sea otter, historically, we estimate that the, the population number for the entire North Pacific was around 300,000. They um, extended all the way from Japan to Russia, across the Aleutians, and all the way down to Baja, Mexico. Um, that has, because of the fur hunting that occurred in the 18th and 19th centuries, um, that limited the, the overall population from 300,000, which was estimated to be at the end of the fur hunting industry, um, about 3,000 3, uh, sea otters total in the North Pacific. And in California, which we're gonna focus a lot of this on California, um, they were hunted to near extinction. And in fact, they were thought to be extinct for at least a decade or two before um, they were rediscovered um, off the coast of Big Sur. And it actually um, got some press back in the day. And so what you see is a picture from Life Magazine from 1938 saying the extinct sea otter swims back to life. And this picture actually came from just below the um, Bixby Bridge in, in Big Sur. And so that's that famous bridge that you see all the car commercials on. That's where that, that um, remnant patch of sea otters uh, existed. And Life Magazine called it a herd. Um, we consider this now as a raft of sea otters. So it was about 50 animals. And from that 50 animals, um, it's been slow, very slowly expanding the range of the sea otter in California. So what you see on the bottom right is a, is a map. Um, that's the California coastline, um, which most of you are familiar with, San Francisco Bay to the north. Um, the, the star is, is that Big Sur population where it was rediscovered. And so this was, you know, this Life Magazine article came out in 1938. Ecology started taking off after World War II, really, um, a little bit in the 30s, but really after World War II, ecology as a field of science really started expanding. 
and around much or not soon after that, you know, the, the first studies of sea otters started coming out with um, Jim Estes' work on the Aleutian Islands sea otter population, which also described them as kind of a kelp forest animal, which was true at the time. That's all really, they were only in these outer kind of coastline margins. Um, but if you think about Big Sur, and I'm not sure how many people have driven the coast of Big Sur, but what you'll know is that coast is very rugged, it's remote, it's hard to get to. Um, even modern day 2020, that, that road, Highway 1, Pacific Coast Highway, shuts down a lot because of landslides, um, and it'll be shut down for weeks at a time. And so, you know, we're, we have troubles just getting to it in the 21st century. You can imagine the early 20th century or even the, the 19th century, how challenging it would be for either somebody by boat or by automobile would be to get to the stretch of co coastline to hunt sea otters. So it kind of, when you put that all together, it kind of makes sense why we find sea otter, why we found sea otters were in the, this remote stretch of Big Sur. Um, so if we put that all together, there's all this historical, historical context mixed with the early ecology of, of the sea otter, um, we have this red circle, this small red circle, which represents our 20th century understanding of the sea otter. Um, then we have the historic, right? The historic niche breadth of the sea otter. And this is where we get to this idea of the skewed baseline. So our understanding of the our baseline in the 20th century was very skewed towards this whole um, historical um, um, phenomena of, of overhunting of the sea otter because of the fur trade industry. But what I'd like to point out is that in this historic, this large circle of the historic, there have been human communities um, through millennia who have understood the ecology of the sea otter. And so we can look back to them too um, for, um, for to get um, historical perspective on what the niche breadth is of the sea otter. So if we fast forward to today, um, this takes us into kind of the research that me and my colleagues have been doing um, that we the, the niche breadth of the sea otter as it's been released from that, that fur trade industry where they were being overhunted to more conservation measures, protecting them as an endangered species or just as a marine mammal through the Marine Mammal Protection Act, they've been slowly expanding. And so along with that, our understanding of the sea otter and their, their what we call the niche breadth, their ability to use different habitats is also expanding. And so we've been basically following around these otters for the last 10 years, um, and we're discovering new things almost all the time um, that were previously unknown to science. And so in the top of right-hand corner is kind of where we start out with is sea otters using estuarine ecosystems, um, estuarine habitats like seagrasses, um, much in the way they use kelp as habitat to rest, to um, feed their pups, to and, and to hunt. Um, <clears throat> but there's there's strike differences between a kelp forest environment and a, a kind of protected embayment or an estuary. Um, in the outer coast, you know, you have a, a lot of more challenges. You have um, a wave swept shoreline. So there's these physical aspects of just living in the kelp forest that are really challenging. Uh, when you dive down for your prey, you have to dive down a lot deeper and that costs energy. And so you, what we're talking about, the difference between a 30 foot dive and a five foot dive in an estuary in a seagrass environment can make a big difference in energetics. Um, and then we think about predators and what, we're gonna talk a little bit about the predator difference in kelp forests versus estuary and ecosystems. Um, However, if you think about the estuary in terms of human hunting, it's also a lot easier to hunt a sea otter in an estuary. We can capture, you know, just doing our scientific surveys, we can capture a lot more sea otters in a single day in an estuary than we could in a kelp forest. And so these are really important facts to, to kind of um, 
digests as we move along. Um, and then right now uh, in the bottom right hand corner, you see a map. Um, that's the current distribution of sea otters in red. And right now, um, it basically expands, it extends from Santa Barbara down to the south and then around uh, north of Santa Cruz, Ani Nuevo um, to the north or Pigeon Point, if you know Pigeon Point um, in San Mateo County. And then we have, you know, basically in that range, only two major estuarine ecosystems, Elkhorn Slough um, in Monterey Bay and then Morro Bay Estuary down south. And both of these um, estuaries have sea otters and have had them since around the early 80s or late 70s. Um, and so when that, when they first started um, using the, uh, these estuaries, I don't think there was a whole lot of people who thought of it um, as, as, a, as a home for the, the sea otter, as a distinct habitat. Um, that was maybe just the coincidence. But now as we, we are now in 2020, we don't think of it as a coincidence anymore that this is really also their habitat. So the first um, study that I was involved in um, focusing on sea otters um, was all due really to the seagrass. And again, I'm a marine botanist and so um, this was part of my PhD work. And when I started my PhD um, as a marine botanist, um, I was really interested in, in seagrasses and algae. And that's where it really all started. And it really started in particular in one location, Elkhorn Slough. And I have to tell you a little bit of the history of Elkhorn Slough too, because it, it, it describes a lot of this story as well. Um, it's a tidal estuary in the heart of Monterey Bay, but it also sits at the foot of one of the major agricultural zones in California, if not the world, um, which we call the Salad Bowl of the United States, which is the Salinas Valley. And in the Salinas Valley, they grow a lot of row crops like lettuce, strawberries, artichokes, Brussels sprouts. These crops and the land that they're growing these crops on, um, these coastal lands in the Salinas Valley are, are very pricey. Um, they're very pricey to lease. They're very pricey to maintain these crops. Um, and starting in the uh, post-World War II, nitrogen fertilizer started becoming really, really cheap. And <clears throat> so the, the strategy for these farmers on, in the Salinas Valley, no, no fault to them, is that you know, they want to increase, the, increase their yield. And if nitrogen is really cheap, you might as well dump as much nitrogen on that land as, as possible. Well, the problem becomes that Elkhorn Slough is in that watershed, and so it receives a lot of that runoff. And what we've recorded is some of the highest nutrient concentrations that we actually have seen on the planet for a coastal ecosystem. Um, and so, you know, this ends up causing algal blooms. And these algal blooms can form in the water column, but they can also um, grow on algae. The algae can be stimulated by these nutrients through a process we call eutrophication, which is this fancy word just meaning too much nutrition in an ecosystem. So you have too much algae. And this algae can grow on the seagrass leaves as we see in this cartoon on the bottom left. And when you get this algal overgrowth on the seagrass, what happens is it is essentially shades out the seagrass and causes it to die. It just can't photosynthesize. Um, and so what I first noticed in Elkhorn Slough was that the, the seagrass was very, very healthy. It had almost no epiphytes growing on it. Um, and it, it kind of, challenge these old ecological paradigms in, in seagrasses. Not, this is totally outside the, the sea otter's domain at this point. And so that's what really kind of sparked my attention is how can a eutrophic nutrient polluted system like this still support not only a thriving eelgrass bed, but an eel, eelgrass beds, seagrass beds, uh, the eelgrass is the species Zostra, but how can, this, which was almost extinct in the 1980s, how can it be recovering this fast and looking this healthy? And so me being a good scientist, I tested a bunch of alternative hypotheses um, dealing with climate 
dealing with nutrient enrichment, dealing with all sorts of more physical factors. Um, but ignoring the sea otters that were swimming with me <laughs> in the seagrass bed. And it only turned out um, kind of at the last a last ditch moment, I was about to give up actually trying to explain this thing that um, at the time I wasn't like, oh, the sea otters had to be doing something. In fact, I was trying to ignore them um, at all costs. And uh, what I got a, a, a data set, a very, very unique data set. And it came from a tour operator um, uh, taking out uh, on a pontoon boat, kind of like a, a houseboat without the house. Um, of tourists on into Elkhorn Slough. And his name is Captain Jan Gideon. He's now retired. Um, but he was running this thing called the Elkhorn Slough Safari for about two decades. And it was so fascinating because um, Jan, Captain Jan would give these tourists on the boat uh, little hand clickers. And he was running a monitoring program of sea otters without really even knowing it. And he told the tourists, every time you see a sea otter, click. And um, so after two decades, he was actually tabulating all this stuff. And I was working with a citizen scientist at the time named Ron Eby, who knew Captain Yon because Ron was in the Navy. Now he's retired and has devoted his whole life to counting sea otters and studying sea otters. Um, they became friends. And so I asked Ron one day, I'm like, hey, Ron, can I maybe take a look at that data set? Um, because we have a really good time series of seagrass and I'm just kind of curious. And when we overlaid the two, they fit like a glove. And it was one of those aha moments where it was like, wait a second, what are these, what is going on here? Is this just a weird coincidence or not? And um, that was the moment I learned to embrace the sea otter. <laughs> and so what we ended up doing um, after that is we used um, Jan's data, Captain Jan's data to kind of inform um, more kind of uh, not sophisticated because what we found out is when we used USGS data that were, they were annually surveying um, sea otters since 1984, um, their data and Captain Jan's data also fit like a glove. And so what it really tells you is the, the harnessing the power of citizen science um, was really, really powerful in this moment because it really informed a whole new line of research. And so what ended up happening in the aftermath is we looked at the USGS data and you know we, we saw these kind of cool time series relating um, sea otters and seagrass. What we didn't know at the time was is it because there's more seagrass, there's more sea otters or vice versa? So we set out to test this and we tested it about every possible way you could imagine. We tested it using this time series data that I was talking about. We tested it, um, there were, at that time in Elkhorn Slough, there was kind of a, a gradient of sea otters. So we we're able to look at this gradient and see, well, if you get more sea otters, do you get more seagrass? And yeah, that's what we found. And then on top of that, we compared estuaries such as Tamales Bay and Drake's Estero to the north, north of San Francisco, very similar estuaries as Elkhorn Slough, but just didn't have sea otters. And what we found was that um, if you have more sea otters, you have more seagrass. And then on top of that, we ran experiments um, both um, in the field where we would um, cage out sea otters in seagrass beds, um, but and we would put uh, what we call a mesopredator in it, a mesopredator crab. And then there would be areas where there would be a cage, but the sea otters could access that cage. And then there would be areas where we didn't have a cage. It's just experimental design. And those all pointed to sea otters enhancing the experiments, pointing to sea otters enhancing the seagrass. And then we did it in mesocosm experiments where we didn't really put a sea otter in there, but we per, put their preferred prey, the crab, in five gallon buckets. And we planted seagrass um, with these things that you see on the left-hand screen in this cartoon are these grazers that I'm talking about. And one is this um, slug looking thing, it's called a sea hare. Um, this pill bug looking thing is called an isopod. 
And these are really important for this whole kind of food web that I'm trying to describe here. And um, <clears throat> the important part of these grazers is that they're herbivores, they live in the seagrass, <clears throat> but they don't eat the seagrass. They're herbivores that don't eat the seagrass because it's too cellulose rich and it has a waxy cuticle, um, but they eat the algae that grows on the seagrass and they almost behave like little lawnmowers. And so <clears throat> in the left-hand side, you see a system or a, a system like Elkhorn Slough pr prior to um, sea otter recolonization. And one key aspect to this also, this trophic cascade is that sea otters, when they move into estuaries, they're not going for urchins because there aren't a ton of urchins. They're going for crab. Crabs, easy prey, high caloric intake. A single otter can eat about 8,000 of these large cancer-like crabs um, closely related to Dungeness crab. So these are large crab. Um, they could eat, uh, one otter can eat about 8,000 of them a year. And so once you take it out and you count, it really, it starts to become obvious. Um, so what we saw in the, in the, the kind of final result was that sea otters, um, when they're not present, the crabs can flourish. These crabs are really good at picking off these grazers in the seagrass. And what you get is this unhealthy seagrass. If you add in the sea otter that can consume uh, the majority of these crabs in actually a pretty quick time, you get these, these grazers, these herbivores that can really flourish. And even in the most nutrient polluted eutrophic environment you can imagine, they can still keep the seagrass clean. Um, so this resulted in a, a pretty big paper that came out in um, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and is now in a textbook. So this has actually become a textbook example of a trophic cascade. So <clears throat> Elkhorn Slough, it's small. It's not a big estuary by any means. You know, the whole estuary goes about 10 kilometers and only about half of that is covered with seagrass. So we're, we're not talking about a significant area, but it, it did a lot to kind of inform future studies, um, especially in areas where there's just a ton of seagrass. And um, so a, a group of us from California, but also Southeast Alaska at the University of Alaska Fairbanks um, wanted to test this hypothesis out in other areas um, where sea otters occur with seagrasses. And so C Southeast Alaska is one of these great places. Um, unlike Elkhorn Slough, um, which has maybe 10 kilometers of seagrass covered shoreline, the Southeast Alaska, especially around Prince of Wales, um, has about 16,000 kilometers of seagrass covered shoreline. And so it was a great place um, to test this hypothesis of sea otter effects on seagrasses um, in, in a system where the sea otters are recovering. And so these, this population of sea otters actually um, was uh, restored from uh, that a group of otters that came from the Aleutians, I believe, um, along with repopulating um, the population in British Columbia and the coast of Washington. And so what we're finding in this system um, is that we see this kind of same relationship uh, between sea otters and seagrass. And this comes from uh, uh, a graduate student from University of Alaska, Alaska Fairbanks who recently graduated, uh, Wendell Raymond, who you see here, um, this yellow line dissecting Wendell is um, a tra our transect line. He has his quadrat, very typical of us um, benthic marine ecologists. We're kind of always have our head in the water looking down. So we don't actually see a lot of the cool things like whales and dolphins and stuff that pass as we're, we're too busy um, counting seagrass shoots in, in, in the water. Um, but this came from Wendell's work um, and his PhD. And what we're seeing is that um, as we see more and more kind of sea otter activity, um, which is what you see in the top or upper left-hand corner of your screen, this is what we call a sea otter index, um, which we put together because we, unlike California, we don't have like this immediate access to sea otters where we can go and follow them around for eight hours. Um, and Alaska is a little more challenging. So we have to put together um, different indicators of sea otter um, effects. And so 
we created this index that basically takes into account sea otter foraging, sea otter densities, um, how often they're there, uh, things like that to create an index. And so the higher you go in the index, as Wendell says, the more sea otterness you get. Um, and what we see is this kind of nice relationship which, between seagrass, this above ground biomass is just the, the biomass of shoots coming out of the mud or the leaves coming out of the mud and sea otter index. So this kind of shows that, well, they, you know, their effects might be positive across a much larger scope than we previously thought. Okay, I'm gonna take a sip of water. This is a good breakdown. Okay, so <clears throat> back to California and Elkhorn Slough. Um, this is where the story became, starts getting really interesting if you didn't find the seagrass interesting. Um, as we're following these otters in, in these seagrass beds in Elkhorn Slough, which are primarily limited to the lower end of the estuary near the ocean, um, we started observing around that time them using a brand new habitat that we never knew they used. And in fact, science never knew they used. Um, and this is what you're about to see is one, a video of kind of one of the, our first encounters with a sea otter in a salt marsh. And in these salt marsh, this salt marsh in particular is, it's pretty far up in Elkhorn Slough. Um, these, this salt marsh in particular, it can get semi-brackish, you know, so you're starting to talk about a lot of freshwater influence um, and otters kind of using what we call a novel habitat. Um, so this video here um, is uh, Elkhorn Slough. This is a tidal, what we call a tidal creek. Um, and then on the land you see is, is the marsh, the salt marsh. And this is pickleweed salt marsh, which we find um, from you know, Mexico all the way up to Alaska. Um, the Alaskans call it sea asparagus. It's actually pretty good to eat. Um, but anyways, what you're also going to see is a sea otter um, doing some foraging behavior, um, kind of cruising around the salt marsh um, and taking out crabs in the salt marsh. So I just want to kind of show you this video first. So what you see is a sea otter munching on these crabs, doing this rolling thing. Um, this, you know, th these otters can, um, if, if they're small crabs like these marsh crabs are, you know, only, you know, less than a, the diameter of your, your index finger. Um, so they can, they have a, a little flap on their chest of skin, which they can actually stuff prey in. So they'll, they'll go in, in the salt marsh and these, these crabs are burrowing in the salt marsh. And what they'll do is they'll, they'll just go grab them, put them, under, put, them, put them under their little skin flap, come to the surface, and then eat them like popcorn. <laughs> and so um, <clears throat> the cool thing about the sea otter, um, which is kind of why I really got interested in it as more of an ecologist, is it's really one of the only marine mammals that we know of that hunts in the, in the benthos, um, dives down, hunts, brings its prey to the surface, shows us researchers what it's about to eat, and, um, and then consumes it. So we have a, a really good understanding of what it's eating, when it's eating, and where it's eating. Um, unlike any other marine predator that I can really think of, you know, maybe some of the whales might be um, uh, uh, an, an exception with feeding on you know, um, forage fish in very obviously and clearly, but you know, for a benthic predator, this is pretty rare. Um, so that's kind of the story of how we kind of discovered how sea otters were using these salt marsh habitats, but we're also interested in what they're doing to the salt marsh. Um, and then, so what we've found is that this system, Elkhorn Slough, um, much like a lot of our salt marsh ecosystems across the world are, are we're losing them. And we're losing them fast because of several processes. Um, sea level rise is a big one. So salt marshes can only occupy a very small range. Um, and sea level rise has the threat of actually drowning the salt marsh. 
But then you get other things happening, like if you can get an overabundance of herb burrowing herbivores, like these crabs I'm talking about, they're a lot different than the, the cancer crabs I showed you in the seagrass. They're, like I said, a lot smaller. Um, they're very common. They're called pachygrapsis, which is the striped shore crab. Uh, we see them, um, uh, they're abundant in the rocky intertidal, but they also use these salt marshes where we're finding that they actually eat the roots of the salt marsh, burrow into the salt marsh, and destabilize it, the whole bank. And so what we've seen in Elkhorn Slough over the last hundred years is this increasing rate of salt marsh erosion where we're losing the salt marsh. And so what we're finding with the sea otter is that their removal of these burrowing and herbivorous crabs can actually enhance the salt marsh. It can actually prevent erosion and loss of the salt marsh. So what we're finding is that not only are they kind of these superheroes of the seagrass beds, but they can also be the superheroes of the salt marsh. On top of that, the, the, you know, if you think about the salt marsh, um, they also have these tremendous opportunities to haul out. And what, you know, when, uh, for an animal that is trying to maintain its temperature, um, this becomes really important. And so, you know, in the kelp forest, they don't have this opportunity. Um, but in the salt marsh, they can, all they have to do is jump onto the salt marsh and then they're out of this cold water. Um, and then if you think about moms raising their pups, you know, all of a sudden you have this habitat um, where you can just put your pup up to rest and then you can basically either roll over or just go dive down a couple feet and you got a, a good amount of prey for you and your pup. Um, so there's kind of these, as we're kind of, this is unfolding, we're kind of seeing these logical benefits um, for the sea otter itself. Okay, so as we're, as we're moving along um, up the estuary, now we're moving towards land, um, we're moving towards more brackish water, we're actually kind of almost getting out, out of the ocean at this point. Um, and the, what we noticed as we started doing these salt marsh studies is that we were, um, so far up the estuary, we're getting into these areas where we have this invasive species in, um, called the European green crab. And the European green crab is this really notorious marine invader. Um, we, it's, it comes from Europe, as the name says, um, but it's invaded the Atlantic coast. Um, it's invaded the Pacific coast. It's, it's moved very fast from the late 80s in San Francisco. It's all the way up to um, British Columbia now. And they can totally disrupt um, food webs and, and take out native, native species. And so as we're um, <clears throat> towing in our boat um, from a dock up in the upper parts of the estuary, uh, I ob started observing this one CR in particular, just going after these green crab. And it we stood there for about a half hour and watched the sea otter eat about 30 of these green crab. And then, of course, when you see something like that, you know how bad this invasion has been and how kind of um, poorly humans are at eradicating this invader um, because of many failed attempts to get rid of the green crab. Um, it turns out that having a sea otter um, is the, maybe the best way of solving the problem. And so in Elkhorn Slough, <clears throat> there's a, a, actually a neat little kind of um, unnatural experiment that actually occurred. There's a railroad, the Union Pacific Railroad basically dissects the estuary. And so on the east side of this railroad towards the land side are basically these tidal gates and culverts that sea otters have a really hard time getting through or getting over the railroad itself. Um, but the green crab have been able to occupy both sides, kind of the ocean side and the land side. Um, and so what we, what that creates is basically a, a barrier for sea otters. And so what we see is that on the side of the sea otters, we almost don't catch green crab anymore. It's almost like they're all gone. So this, this invader that's basically been occupying this, this area of the, the estuary for several decades is now gone. But when we go to the other side, the, the land side of the railroad where sea otters have a hard time accessing, they're, they're still very abundant. And so um, that, this is kind of work that's um, 
still in kind of development, but we're seeing already kind of these results starting to pop out just through this observational time series kind of work. So um, it really kind of demonstrates that when we think about restoration, either from the habitat side or from invasive species management um, perspective, um, what we can see is that actually restoring the food webs might have multiple benefits for the ecosystem. And so what this work kind of resembles is, you know, this decades worth of work is uh, what we call a novel rediscovered food web. Novel being because we do have new species that we didn't have previously like the green crab that are a big part of the food web now. Um, but we now we're also adding in the sea otter to this estuarine food web. And by adding that, it's basically, that's where we get the rediscovery because based on these historical records of, of the fur traders and midden sites around these estuaries from indigenous communities that date back thousands of years, the, the archeology span and the ecology and the history of it all really point to sea otters as being not only kelp forest animals, but also these estuarine important estuarine animals as well. So it kind of brings us back to this question, you know, I, I think I've demonstrated a little bit that sea otters can be beneficial for an estuary, but what can, sea, what can estuaries do for the sea otter? You know, this is a big management and conservation type of question. And what we're seeing is both from examples from Alaska and from California is that these kind of outer coast environments are places where sea otters are really under threat from um, predation. So once they move outside the estuary, they're no longer the top predator. Um, you have killer whales up in Alaska and great white sharks down in California that are really limiting um, their recovery. And so we can look at estuarine ecosystems within um, these two regions to see, well, are, are otters possibly benefiting from having estuaries and these shallow water protected habitats as kind of these predation refugia? And so in the upper left-hand corner in that, um, um, in panel A, that's from Adak Island in Alaska. So that's one of the islands in the, uh, the Aleutian Islands. And what we've seen in, in the recent history is that killer whales, probably through a little bit of the Marine Mammal Protection Act, through you know, the recovery of, of seal populations and sea lion populations, um, they've benefited, but they've also reduced those prey down quite a bit. And so they need to go to alternative prey. And sea otters in Alaska is one of those prey. Um, but what we see here is that we have in blue is we have the outer coast. And so the sea otters were doing quite well through this period of, of management and protections. But more recently in the last few decades, they've kind of crashed. Um, there's one lagoon in particular in this um, island chain, uh, Clam Lagoon, which is kind, kind of famous. It has, it's very shallow has one of the largest seagrass beds on the planet. And what we see from uh, the population status in, in this system is that while outer coast sea, otter sea otters have crashed, the clam lagoon population is actually holding steady and doing quite well, indicating that this is a strong um, um, area of predation refugia for the sea otter. Now, if we look into central California, uh, the California otter population, what we have going on is great white sharks um, uh, lethally hunting them um, in both the northern end of the range, but also the southern end of the range. And both ends of these range are kind of these hot spot nursery areas. Um, I like to call them the mothership for great white sharks uh, along the California coast. And it's these juveniles that cause the problem. It's not these adults these big, the big, large, great whites, it's the juveniles. It's the, the five foot to you know, eight foot range juveniles that are learning how to hunt um, and learning what their prey is. And what they end up doing is they bite the sea otter. They don't actually usually eat it even, but that cause a mortal, causes a mortal wound in the 
otter washes up to the shore and um, just to, to the morphology of the bite mark, you, you can trace it back to the great white shark. So that's how scientists have figured out um, how you know, great white sharks have really been limiting the expansion of sea otters in California. And that expansion is now kind of plateau, you know, the expansion is plateaued. They're not moving across this great white shark gauntlet. And that's why managers like US Fish and Wildlife Service are really interested in these estuaries as potential um, areas of sea otter recovery and not having to worry about the predators. And so this really leads us to one of our largest estuaries in the United States, the San Francisco Bay Estuary. And this is about 60, 80 kilometers north of the current northern range limit for sea otters. Um, between San Francisco and Pigeon Point, there is this great white shark mothership and they just can't seem to cross that gauntlet. And so managers are looking towards areas where we know the great white sharks aren't. And San Francisco Bay is one of those likely spots. Um, another spot is Drake's Estero, um, which is much smaller than San Francisco Bay, um, but has its own kind of characteristics that might be ideal. Um, I might talk about that in a little bit. But so if we look back at San Francisco, you know, we have to kind of figure out, well, you know, where sea otters here in the past, you know, how many were there? Um, San Francisco has changed a lot since the 1800s. It's super urbanized. The estuaries changed dramatically. The shorelines changed. Um, all these sorts of factors kind of play in. Um, but there, there was a book in the 19, published in the 1930s by a woman named Adele Ogden, which is actually kind of one of my favorite books and one of my favorite sea otter references. Um, it's called The Sea Otter Trade from 1784 to 1848, the major time period of, of um, sea otter hunting. And so Russian fur traders, Spanish fur traders um, were operating in the San Francisco Bay and they took meticulous records of, of these pelts coming in. And the estimates that were that they could have been hunting about or bringing in about 100 sea otters a day out of San Francisco. And there's a passage in this book from Ogden that was quite striking. And it comes from an account from one of these um, Spanish fur traders um, who described San Francisco Bay when they first saw it. And I'm just gonna read that. So in the bay from San Francisco to the estuary of Santa Clara, the ground appeared covered with black sheets due to the great quantity of otters which were there. So they were forming these massive rafts in San Francisco Bay you know, and they were forcing, and you see the hunters again, these Alouette hunters from the Aleutian Islands to come down to San Francisco Bay and hunt these animals. Um, and so they wiped them out of San Francisco Bay quite quickly. Um, <clears throat> but our estimates, you know, historically could have been um, definitely the otters were probably in the thousands, if not the 10,000 um, um, range of sea otters. And so, like I said, San Francisco Bay, it's changed a lot since then. Um, it was a much more natural estuary um, than what it is now, which is this highly urbanized estuary. Um, we, we think the habitats, the, the key habitats like salt marshes, um, mud flats, seagrass beds have, have also diminished quite rapidly in that time period. And, but we can use information that we've gained from Elkhorn Slough. So Elkhorn Slough has a lot of these same habitats. It has seagrass beds, marshes, salt marshes, or, or mudflats, um, open water environments that the, the otters also use. Um, and what is great about Elkhorn Slough is that the, the, the population itself has reached carrying capacity. And that's really important because we can actually model um, based on Elkhorn Slough and, and a couple other uh, systems, we can actually model the population growth rate as a function of habitat. Um, so each one of these habitats has a, a different population growth rate. It's, you know, it's higher in some habitats and, and lower in others. And so we can take all this information that we gained previously and apply it to San Francisco Bay. 
and try to come up with an estimate of how many sea otters the bay currently could support. And um, so, you know, it's part of this is a modeling, uh, a part of it is a little bit of a thought experiment of, okay, well, say there was a reintroduction of sea otters, um, you know, let's start out with 20 animals, 10 males and 10 females, and that's what we did. And let's put it into the model, let it run for 50 years and see what we get. And so what we see is um, a, a, a typical logistic growth rate for a population. You'll note that the error bars are quite large. So there is a little bit of uncertainty to this model. Um, but what, we, what it indicates is what previous, uh, previous studies have kind of indicated is that sea otters in, in um, San Francisco Bay, San Francisco Bay could probably likely support about 6,000 sea otters. Um, <clears throat> and this is kind of huge for conservation of sea otters. Uh, the California population, which is considered a subpopulation um, in Hydrolutris nereus, um, under the Endangered Species Act, they're still listed under the Endangered Species Act. And the problem has been this range expansion issue. You know, they've been hovering around this magical number of 3,000. The 3,000 is the number to get them out of extinction status. You know, they, some years they're a little bit above, some years they're lower. It's never enough to actually lift them off the endangered species list. Um, but we estimate that in, if, you know, sea otters were to um, recolonize San Francisco Bay, we're likely looking at about 6,000 sea otters in a period of you know, three to five decades, um, which would end up tripling the current California population just with sea otters in San Francisco. So you know, this is all great, but like I said, San Francisco Bay, it's a highly urbanized um, estuary with a lot of risk associated with this, um, with sea otters. And so, what you see here is basically a map of those risks. And in fact, this is probably as, as new of information as you possibly can get. Um, the paper that um, this analysis came from was just published today. And this was all based on a graduate student from San Francisco State's research, Jane Rudebush. Um, and she was really interested in this question surrounding sea otters in San Francisco Bay, but primarily looking at it from a risk perspective. Um, so she took into account the, she took spatial maps of all these kind of different risks, be it um, major shipping channels, um, uh, contaminants, um, the, the risk of oil spills, and a couple other different factors to map out where the major risk would occur. And what you can see is you get a lot of risk the more red you get. And so the more red you get like around the Golden Gate um, is really highlighted by a lot of these sh shipping channels and major shipping lanes, ferry lanes um, that could really kind of affect sea otters, um, their behavior, what habitats they use. But also what it kind of indicates here and in, is if we look at the two maps, so here is where we're predicting otters would most heavily use. Um, a lot of indications really support kind of the North Bay of probably being a really good place. And a lot of it has to do not only with the habitats that we see there, but also the risk. A lot of the risk as you move up into the North Bay um, gets a lot lower. And a lot of it has to do with a lot of the uh, land management and, and estuarine, manage, estuarine habitat management that's going on all around in the North Bay. Um, so there's, there's a good amount of seagrass, healthy salt, salt marshes um, that could all be really good for the sea otter. Um, so I want to kind of just point out that we're not just looking at San Francisco Bay because there's so many factors that go into sea otters living in San Francisco Bay. We're also looking at estuaries outside of San Francisco Bay, um, such as estuaries in the Point Reyes National Marine Shore. In particular, we're looking at um, this one ecosystem, which is kind of hangs off on the left here um, and almost looks like it's not even part of, of the North America continent, which it's not. It's actually part of the Pacific Plate. Um, uh, 
but this is Point Reyes. Um, this to the immediate right of that or to the east, you, you'll see kind of like this finger like inland or inlet. That's Drake's Estero. And Drake's Estero is quite fascinating because it's part of the National Park Service, um, part of Point Reyes. And um, there, it's a, also a wilderness area, <laughs> which makes it very unique because it's a wilderness area. And so the, the park itself has um, kind of the strong motivation to bring back the, the natural, um, not only habitats, but the natural wildlife that existed prior to European kind of colonization and takeover. And so <clears throat> there's a lot of kind of cool factors that come to play. There's these great habitats there, um, such as seagrasses and salt marshes. It's protected. There's very little human influence, maybe a few kayakers. Um, and so it's kind of like this, this great wilderness area where sea otters would be kind of outside the, the risk of humans like you would find in San Francisco Bay. But the trade-off is it's a lot smaller than San Francisco Bay. So when we're talking San Francisco Bay can sport thousands, a place like Drake Stero might only be able to sport, you know, 100, 200 sea otters. But that might be enough to kind of populate the Northern California where sea otters have been extirpated for um, 100, 150 years. So we're looking at, you know, a broad portfolio of options for the sea otter. Um, we're also taking into account uh, the prey that exists in these different populations or in these different um, systems. Uh, and this is going to come out as kind of an, an updated model where we look at not only the habitat availability, but also the prey availability um, to get a more accurate number of sea otters that these systems can support. And so what you see here is on the left, you see um, Danielle Smith, who was an undergrad in my lab, who was doing a lot of survey work of the marsh crabs, um, like I talked about earlier. Um, we've been doing a lot of surveys um, out in the, in the estuary itself with Drake Sestero. Um, so this, these are all taken in Drake Sestero. And what we see in Drake Sestero, unlike um, San Francisco Bay, is that, and this is what you see on the, the right-hand graph, is we see a lot of crab. Um, it would be a buffet of crab um, for the, any sort of initial colonization of sea otters. So it, it, again, this kind of indicates that, you know, we, we should be looking at all sorts of systems for sea otter recolonization or recovery. Um, and so, and just for reference, you can see what Elkhorn Slough looks like off to the right here. You know, there's almost no crab left after the otters have reached carrying capacity. Morro Bay, um, it's a, a, a little bit different. The sea otters are there, but they don't use the entire estuary or um, they, there's a lot of the kind of the, um, upper parts of the estuary they don't use, unlike Elkhorn Slough. So there's a little bit more crab there. Um, then you get in San Francisco Bay where there's a lot more crab and then you get in Drake's Sterile where it's just like, whoa, this place is just loaded with crab. Um, so this is all going to form what the next steps for sea otter um, management. This is previously the, the really interesting thing is that the management plan for the sea otter, the recovery management plan, really hasn't incorporated estuaries at all, other than like maybe a brief message, a brief um, word about San Francisco Bay. Um, it's almost like the management plan would, did not even consider uh, uh, these estuaries prior to all of this research. So now updated management plans are going to consider estuaries as these important um, areas for sea otter recovery. But we can also think about the kelp forest, that's okay. Um, Northern California um, has been hit with a series of catastrophic events, um, starting with warming, uh, some, some significant ocean warming events. Um, we've, they, they've previously been undescribed, so the scientists have just called uh, the more recent warming events that we've seen from 2015 to present as the blob. And the blob has basically um, created these conditions where uh, the warming, the temperature of the water actually exceeds thresholds of the, the primary kelp forming the kelp forest in Northern California. On top of it, the, with the loss of the historic loss of the sea otters, 
And then this new thing called sea, or sea star wasting disease, the other major predator of sea urchins. And we're seeing this proliferation of sea urchins occur. So we get this kind of one, two punch of warming um, mixed with the loss of predators, probably due to a lot of uh, disease and that is caused by warming, um, decimating our kelp forests. So the kelp forests, 90% of them have been lost in Northern California. And so, you know, if we look at sea otter recolonization of estuaries, these might be ideal for repopulating Northern California, which actually could probably benefit from a, a predator like sea otters to remove these urchin barrens that have been forming over the last few years. So there could be these kind of benefits that span multiple ecosystems from sea otter recovery. And really, you know, uh, and this is not talked about very often in, in the recovery plans for Northern California kelp forests, but I think we need to think about sea otters as being ghosts of Northern California kelp forest past. So that's the end of my talk. Um, I'm going to finish with this question, you know, that we posed at the be uh, that I posed at the beginning. What is a sea otter? Is it really a kelp forest animal, or is the sea otter really uh, uh, an estuarine otter, also a sea otter? Um, and maybe even as we follow their expansion uh, beyond that. Um, and then, of course, I need to highlight um, all the collaborators. You know, me, I'm the benthic ecologist who likes to study plants. So, uh, you know, I work with a team of people um, from, you know, up in the top or left, um, Tim Tinker from the USGS and Mich Michelle Stadler from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, who have been doing this for decades. And they're my, they're my sea otter gurus. And the, the woman in the middle, Susan Williams, she's um, my seagrass guru. She was my PhD mentor, postdoc mentor. She recently passed away in a car crash. Um, so that was a huge loss to lose a mentor like that. Um, you see various students, you know, students are working on their theses, on their PhDs, doing um, a lot of the extension of, of this research. Um, in the middle there, you see managers, um, the, the woman smiling with the, um, that predatory moon snail is Lillian Carswell, who her old job is um, managing the recovery of sea otters in California. And then you have ecosystem managers to the left, like at Elkhorn Slough, that's Dave Felice and Mark Silverstein who kind of run that place. Um, we have citizen scientists to the left. Um, in the boat, you see Ron Eby, who I mentioned, um, he's a retired naval uh, officer um, who's dedicated his life to studying sea otters. Um, <clears throat> Robert Scholes is his partner um, to the right, who's a retired sheriff's deputy from Monterey County. And it's quite fascinating because, you know, it, if I thought back, you know, 10 years ago, um, and if someone told me I'd be working with a naval captain and a sheriff's officer, I'd probably laugh at them in the face. Um, that there's no way I'd be working with them, uh, absolutely not, but they've been great. They're my eyes and ears on the, on the land and so, and in the sea, and they, they are observing otters almost every day. Um, and so, you know, this great network of collaborators, students, citizen scientists, managers, um, all really go into this research and, and this really applied aspect of, of the research and informing sea otter conservation and recovery. So last, I just want to thank these funders, and um, I just want to point out that if you're in the town of Moss Landing to slow down in your car, because um, sea otters are now starting to cross the road. In fact, we've had to put speed bumps in, no, in sea otter crossing signs to alert the general public of, of this issue. Um, there's been sea otters that actually been hit by cars, <laughs> and because they're trying to get across the road to get to these brackish water marshes. It's almost like they're moving onto land um, right in front of our eyes. And so we're gonna just continue to following these sea otters around and, and learning from them. So um, thank you for your time. And I think there's time for questions. Absolutely, yes. And we have a number of questions for you. Okay. Um, so I've tried to group them together. <clears throat> Um, so let's talk first of all about um, behaviors. <clears throat> so we had a question about sea otters uh, 
Uh, do they really carry around a preferred rock or tool for days or even weeks at a time? Um, I haven't seen that in the estuary, to be honest with you. I think they'll grab a tool when they need to. And in, this is in the estuary. Um, and then once, once they're done with that or the use for it, then they discard it because it's, it's kind of like, I would think carrying around dead weight, you know, and when you're battling with um, calories and doing your calorie budget every single day, the last thing you want is to carry around five pounds, extra pounds with you. <laughs> um, so that's my thought on that. And, you know, maybe they do in other systems. I haven't seen it though at all. Great, thank you. And it, how, how long do sea otters live? At what age do they um, become sexually mature? And how often do they give birth? <laughs> yeah, so um, again, this is probably more for uh, the sea otter biologist, but I, I think I can answer this. So okay. the average lifespan, is, I believe, is eight to 10 years, something like that. Um, they can pr pretty much, you know, they, they become sexually mature pretty quick, I think, within a year after, giving, after being born. Um, and then the, what was the third question? Um, how often do they give birth? How often do they? Yeah, it's about one pup a year. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that may tie into one of the questions that we received, which is, you know, if, if the hunting practices have been curtailed for so long, why is it taking so much time for the otters to come back and to repopulate into the estuaries? Yeah, so, um, you know, it really, and this is from Tim Tinker's work, who I mentioned just in the last slide. Um, a, a lot of it has to do with the shoreline and the, the um, just the, the simple morphology of shorelines. In California, you gotta think of it as this area where they, they really have only two ways, maybe three ways to go. They can either go north or they can go south. Um, some of them around Santa Barbara, Ventura, can go to the Channel Islands. Um, and that's about as far, you know, they only have a few directions to go. And so that's been one of the reasons that's really limited recovery on top of the, sh the sharks. Um, but if you look in a place like Southeast Alaska, they, their population is booming. And in Alaska, what you see is, you know, I showed that, that map of Southeast Alaska. And it's just the network of islands and inlets. And there's just a lot more places for them to go and occupy and habitat. So their recovery has been a lot faster. So it really depends on the, the coastal morphology, the shoreline morphology um, has a lot to do with it. Okay, and since you brought in Alaska and some of the other regions north, um, it's probably a good time to talk about some of the other populations. So we had a question, how many different kinds of sea otters are there? Um, and um, how do you identify individual sea otters? Yeah, so our understanding right now is there are basically two distinct subpopulations. They're all in Hydra Lutris. Um, from the, and there's the California population, which is considered the southern population um, in Hydrolychus nereus, and they they tend to be a little bit smaller than the northern or the northern variety, the northern Pacific variety, which is in Hydrolychus kenyani, and they tend to be a little bit bigger, a little bit more robust. Um, Ge somewhat, I think, genetically distinct though. Uh, and so basically we have California, but then the Northern population consists of Washington. Um, there, there, there's a population on the uh, Olympic Peninsula. Uh, and then British Columbia, which is basically Western Vancouver Island and some of the islands North of Vancouver Island. And then you have the Southeast Alaska population, which is very similar to all the Northern Washington, British Columbia and the Aleutians. Um, and then you have the Aleutian population. And then, you know, there's some, there, there used to be, uh, I, can't, I think there's still kind of a, a Russian population off uh, Kachamak Island. Um, and there used to be a population in Japan, but I, I don't believe, I don't know if it's there still. 
Um, so that's kind of how it, it breaks down. It used to be a continuous um, range distribution from Japan all the way to Mexico. Um, but now it's, we're talking about distinct segments. And do you know if there is interbreeding between these groups? There's not a lot. Um, and so for California, you know, it's basically a genetic bottleneck that uh, goes all the way back to that Big Sur population of 50 animals. Um, the, the Northern population, it basically came from, a, I believe a single group that was um, relocated to these different areas in Alaska, British Columbia, and then Washington. Um, so they basically are genetically very similar. Um, uh, so yeah, but in terms of these kind of different subregions, there's very little uh, at this point until they kind of start reducing that, that those gaps, there's very little um, genetic um, exchange there. Okay. And then um, do you identify or, or how are individuals identified if, if not by oh, you? Oh yeah, that question. Um, so tags, flipper tags mm -hmm. are a big one. So, you know, they'll use um, basically a combination of colors. So they'll tag flippers and they'll put different um, colors on different digits. And that allows to in, uh, distinguish between individuals. Some of them, um, they do do tagging studies. So they actually um, surgically implant a radio tag and that can also identify individuals. Yeah. Great. Um, some questions about habitat. Um, are you seeing a range expansion uh, for sea otters along the Marin and Sonoma coasts? No, and that's because, you know, they haven't made it there yet. There, there are these, and you'll see in the, you know, if you look in the news, um, look back in the news, the, the, you'll get reports of sea otters in San Francisco Bay, in Drake's Estero, in Tomas Bay, sometimes even in Humboldt Bay. Um, these are oftentimes um, uh, confused male juveniles um, who have just wandered too far. And so they'll go into a place like San Francisco Bay and they'll hang out for a couple weeks and then, but they're usually males. And then once they realize there's no mates there, then they'll try to swim back to where they came from. Um, and, you know, they have the, there's a big, strong sexual dimorph, or not dimorphism, but sexual differences between the males and females and how long they, how far they move. The males tend to move a lot further. The females have a really um, small home range where they only, at the most during their lifetime, only move their home about six kilometers, maybe 10 kilometers. And so that's the big, that's another big issue for their recovery is the males don't even matter. <laughs> it's the females that matter. And so um, without the females moving in San Francisco, you can have a bajillion males, but um, in a generation, they'll all be gone. So um, the key is the females and the females just don't move very far. And so this relates to another question, which was how do you decide when the animals do move uh, into other areas, how do you decide whether it's because they can versus because they need to? Oh, I don't think there's any way to distinguish that. Um, I, I, yeah, I, 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 the, what the, the intent is, is beyond our, our knowledge. So um, they move in there, you know, I, I think they move in there because there is habitat, there is food, um, but without the mate, then, you know, that, that um, kind of sexual drive can, leads them out of there to go um, looking for a mate because they have a really strong sex drive. Um, you know, they're mating constantly. Um, if you go to, a Elkhorn Slee is the best place to see it. They're always mating. It's a very vicious mating um, ritual that happens where the males kind of force themselves on the females, um, almost like they're drowning them. They'll actually um, mount them and then they'll, the the bite on the female's nose and kind of force it force her head back and just gnarl on her nose while they're uh, mating and so when you if you go out into and see sea otters and you see a sea otter with a pink nose you, you probably know that it's a female and that it's been mating 
quite a bit um, because of, of the scars to its nose. Um, but the, the females are kind of always in, you know, a, a, a pregnancy state or a gestation state or a nursing state. They almost never get out of that cycle. It's always happening. And so the, the life of a female sea otter is very rough. Um, oftentimes you'll see them very skinny, just skin and bones. And it's, it's, it's because they're, they have this hard life where they're having to constantly fend off males who will steal their food. They'll steal the food from the pup. Um, they'll harass the pup, they'll harass the mother. Um, so the mother constantly has to battle this. And so um, you'll often see them looking very emaciated and unhealthy. Um, and that's usually when they're in the process of nursing. Um, it, it just, it's a really hard life. Um, we have some questions about recovery plans. A um, couple questions came in about certain areas and whether or not they've been looked into such as Tomales Bay and Bolinas Lagoon. Um, have they been considered as potential locations for other <clears throat> populations? Yeah, so what, what we're doing right now, so we've kind of done a lot of the work in San Francisco Bay. We understand that it has huge be potential benefits, but a lot of the risks. Um, we're right now in the process of looking at Tomales Bay and Drake's Estero. So that research is kind of ongoing right now. Um, with the idea that in about a year we'd be um, um, writing our reports that will go directly to informing the management. So I think in the future that the, those locations will definitely be considered um, in the recovery plans. Okay. Um, and a couple questions about sea level rise. Uh, basically the gist is um, how do you, anticipate sea level rise affecting the viability of some of the areas that are being considered for you know repopulation etc yeah. I, I i think it, um from the perspective of the sea otter i don't think it will matter all that much because if a salt marsh gets drowned um it's probably going to convert to a seagrass bed <laughs> or a mud flat or a sand flat so um from the sea otter perspective, it might not matter all much, but from the, from the salt marsh perspective, it might matter a lot. Um, especially when you're considering that salt marshes um, survive and persist based on their ability to constantly accrete more and more sediments. I mean, they're constantly building themselves. And so when you add components like sea level rise mixed with, um, you know, like things like burrowing crabs, and, and consumers that are going to destabilize the shoreline and the in the in the marsh itself, um, that's where the the importance of the sea otter can really come in. And so um, for the sea otter, I don't think it will actually have too much of a negative effect. It's really, you know, our sea otters important could could and sea otters be important for uh, salt marsh um, resilience in the face of sea level rise. I think that's where the, the, the main focus really is. Okay, great. Um, let's see. And I, I think you partially answered this, but I'll ask the question anyway. Um, so you mentioned that in the San Francisco Bay models, um, you were estimating, uh, you and your partners in the research were estimating there could be a population of about 6,000. How does that compare to the estimates of prior historical population in San Francisco Bay? Yeah, so um, I, some of you might be familiar with the name Kristen Ladry or Ladra um, from the University of Washington. And so she did some earlier studies, kind of just more doing the back of the envelope calculations based on the area of San Francisco Bay and how many otters that could support. And she, I think, came up with an estimate of about 8,000. So our model is very conservative too. Um, you, you'll see there's big error bars around it, but it's 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 very conservative in the kind of the parameters that we put into it. Um, and so her estimate was about eight thousand. Our, our, our that is in in the range of what we found. Um, historically, uh, there's been kind of numbers thrown out, like there was ten thousand. 
uh, sea otters historically in San Francisco Bay, but I think that's really hard to to actually show or prove um, with any sort of confidence. But you know, based on these historical accounts, you know, the, the bay appeared to be covered in black sheets to the quantity of sea otters that were there, according to the the Adele Ogden book, um, really kind of highlight that. And then on, on top of it, there's the Native American middens around the bay, like around the town of Emeryville, there's the Emeryville shell mound, which is just loaded with sea otters and sea otter bones, um, all the way down to the low stratigraphy, which is, you know, thousands of years ago. So um, there's a good indication that, and we've been looking at the kind of the archeological data from these estuaries and the ones with middens and they all have these strong indications that their sea otter, the sea otters were there. And a lot of these sites like Emeryville, for example, are far away from a kelp forest. So it almost seems, you know, we're talking 60 miles of travel either by boat or by land um, to, to, for a, 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 an indigenous um, um, person to actually go hunt in the kelp forest and extract a sea otter and then move it 60 miles to Emeryville just seems very highly unlikely. And so we're, we're tying together a lot of this kind of historical evidence um, that really lends support to the, the idea that sea otters are not just sea otters, but estuarine otters. A um, couple of questions about river otters. Yeah, you mentioned that river otters can be sea otters. Um, can we learn from river otters um, as to how to help the recovery of sea otters and have river otters been doing better at recovering than sea otters? Yeah, the, the river otter is doing quite well. And river otter was almost heading in the same direction as stellar sea cow. Um, they were hunted to near extinction in, in North America and they've been um, recovering quite nicely and quite rapidly. Here in the Bay Area, they've kind of been um, migrating south. Um, their recovery has a southward trajectory. Um, they, just a couple of years ago, you know, they were, or, you know, maybe like, I, I can't exactly tell you um, the exact years, but, you know, five or six years ago, they were in the North Bay. Um, fast forward, you know, to a couple of years ago, they were in the South Bay around San Jose and Coyote Creek. Now they're all the way down in Gilroy in Monterey County. Um, so they're, they're, the, the expansion of the, the river otter has been uh, much more rapid than the sea otter. Um, the river otter has also a much more expansive niche than the sea otter. You know, we're talking about an animal and we've seen this from the, the analysis of scat, the poop we collect, um, the river otter can eat almost anything you know we've seen it eat scats with deer fragments and and rat rat bones um you know fish scales and vertebra all the way down to what the sea otter eats like urchins and 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 mussels and um crab so they can just eat a whole lot more they can use so many different habitats that their expansion because probably because of that um, has occurred a lot more rapidly than the sea otter. Great. A um, couple more questions and then I think we'll wrap it up. Um, in the waters that you do your work in, um, what are the average depths and um, <laughs> particularly in the Alcorn Slough and the local coastal waters? <laughs> and then if you don't usually get into the water, how much can you actually see? So <laughs> this is funny. Um, so over the last 10 years, you know, almost every summer and almost every day of the week, um, ex excluding the last couple of summers because of COVID and just my transition to a professor position, um, I would swim with sea otters about eight hours a day <laughs> in Elkhorn Slough. And um, we would be, you know, a lot of our work is on scuba um, these sea grasses are extremely shallow. Um, we're talking about, you know, four or five feet. And so it's funny because we, we have these kind of safety protocols for scuba diving. And, you know, like if you're scuba diving, it's like, oh, I'm having troubles underwater. You know, what do you do when you, you know, are out of air or you're having gear malfunctions or something's wrong? You know, like 
you find your buddy and try to go up. And so um, our, our safety protocol in Elkhorn Slough is if you're having any problems scuba diving, then stand up <laughs> and then you're, you're out of the water. Um, so it's very shallow. Um, it's weird diving. It's very strange, but it's also great. Um, we've been able to figure out the oceanography behind these systems where we only dive on um, flood tides or incoming tides because that brings in all the kind of clearer ocean water um, where we can at least get a foot of visibility. Um, some on the good days we can get five feet, maybe six feet in the very, very, very best days we can get maybe 10 feet. So oftentimes we're talking about in our work, we're literally have our heads in the mud. Um, not literally, but just above the mud. And so, uh, you know, I'll be, when I say I'm swimming with sea otters, it's I'm usually just face down in mud and seagrass and there's 20 or 30 otters swimming around me. And they, after about a month diving with sea otters on, you know, several hours a day or every day of the week, they start becoming accustomed to you. And so like so, <laughs> some of the aquarium raised otters through their surrogate program, um, are ultra friendly with me, um, almost too friendly that it becomes a little bit nerve wracking, but, uh, <laughs> that, yeah. So I've spent a lot of time swimming with these sea otters. Um, it, yeah. And it's, 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 it's fun. You know, I haven't had any issues with the sea otters. I kind of give them their space. Um, obviously I'm in their territory, so, um, I got to respect that. And so, I'm very aware all the time of where they're at and um, what they're doing, and so, yeah, it's 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 very it's a very unique experience. It sounds magical, actually. Yeah. It's um, cool. So uh, another question for you about sea otters: uh, Is there currently a black market for sea otter pelts? Ooh, that I don't know. I mean, so the indigenous communities up in Alaska, there, and maybe British Columbia. I'm not quite sure. But Alaska, Southeast, they're allowed to hunt them. Um, but they have all, all these rules loaded on top of the hunting um, where the otter, if you hunt it, um, it has to be extracted. You have to remove it. And you have to use almost every single part of its body um, for um, artisanal purposes, um, be it, you know, making the pelts into um, steering wheel covers or um, you know, using the bones for you know some sort of jewelry or whatever it might be um, and the indigenous communities know that and they kind of they they abide by those laws um, in terms of the black market I, I I haven't heard anything so I'm just gonna punt on this a little bit and say I, I don't know I I haven't seen anything like that Okay, well, we'll hope there isn't. Yeah, right. And then last question to close out, um, just because of time, is do you know where the Elkhorn Slough Bachelors went? Ooh, the, the question is, where did the Elkhorn Slough Bachelors go? So- I mean, this is quite typical of range expansion. You get the juvenile colony of males that kind of move into a new area and that's kind of what establishes it. And that's what happened in Elkhorn Slough. Um, the juvenile, there was a juvenile colony that just kind of hung out near the mouth. And I think, you know, this is in the early 80s and all the way to really, you know, recently there was kind of this weird juvenile group of males that just hung out in the, um, in, in towards the mouth of the estuary. Um, as more and more otters moved in, what ended up happening was alpha males started establishing up and down the estuary. So you have actually distinct harems that exist now. Um, that juvenile patch will come and go. It still comes and goes, I believe. Um, but now you have a situation where you, you still have that patch, but now you have up the estuary, you know, these territorial males that are holding on to their harems. Um, and uh, so in what, what has happened now is you actually have entire generations of sea otters in Elkhorn Slough that have never seen a kelp forest in their life. And they've only seen, they only know the estuary. And I think that's a really important part of this whole story is that 
they've actually established there. And they're now, there's a permanent um, population there. And that population in Elkhorn Slough has the highest concentration of sea otters in California. Um, so I think that really lends to the importance of these habitats for the sea otter. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. This was, has been just a incredibly informative and fascinating talk. Cool. Um, uh, Susan, do you have any closing remarks? Yeah, I just really want to echo that. I, I just can't believe how much I've learned about not only otters, but the dynamics of ecosystems and uh, just how everything is truly connected. So Brent, thank you so very much. Um, mm -hmm. there, there were just a few other questions that um, uh, you know, maybe we can send to you and you, you might answer. Absolutely, no, absolutely, no problem. I'd be happy to. And, th and thank you all for spending your Tuesday night with me. <laughs> this is great. Um, and it, it's great to kind of be able to reach out to a, a new um, kind of like-minded group, right? And so with the, the ACS, so this, this has been a thrill. Well, we'll um, definitely with that, invite you back um, another time. So <laughs> well, I hope I have new discoveries to, to tell you next time. Yeah, that. I, I love that um, some of that was just breaking news, something that was just published today. So keep up all the great work, Brent. And thank yeah. you again. And thank you, ACS community.